You know what the best thing in life is? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It's joy. You agree with me on that? Yes. Yeah. Rare commodity nowadays because for various reasons we won't get into, but um, I want to suggest to you that the most important element in life and the, the dynamic in life which will produce more fruit in terms of a walk with God and successful life generally is joy. Now, what I'm going to do today is conclude the series on Isaiah 53, all the while asking the question, in this passage, where's joy to be found? Okay? So that is our question, and then we'll conclude with some, some other remarks about joy. But you'll recall that last week, we uh, two weeks ago, I'm sorry, we talked about uh, a very interesting evidence for the reliability of the Besora of the New Testament scriptures, and, and a, a reason for validation for our own faith. Uh, at Ruach Israel, we have this idea, and, and I think you'd probably agree with it, and that is to walk with God and to live life successfully, heart and head have to go together. Would you agree with that, just in principle? Yeah, it's head and it's heart. In other words, you, there has to be, to be motivated to do the highest things and the best things and live for the highest things, you've got to feel that there's a fundamental consonance and agreement for the things that your mind is telling you and the things that your heart are telling you. And if you're out of sync on either side of the equation, then it damages the other. In other words, if I didn't feel and believe, and I, I'm, I know this is true for you too, if we didn't think our faith was true, then how could we allow our emotions and our heart and our, and our inner world to be, to be excited and joyful about something that deep inside really doesn't think is true at all? You see what I'm saying? But conversely, if we have terrific head knowledge and we know all these different things and fully articulate all kinds of clever stuff and important stuff, but yet our emotions and our that sense of the big wow, I call it the big wow, and the joy part of the equation is missing, then I'll tell you, it's not a happy life. It's not a good way to be. So what we believe is in bringing them together. So today we're gonna to do a little bringing together. And again, the basic point I'm trying to make is that the most important thing in life is what? Joy. joy. It really is. And I, we want you to have more joy. So, First of all, a little bit of review of what I talked about two weeks ago. And Rabbi Nathan took this whole subject further last week very effectively uh, when he talked about the, the accounts of Yeshua's death and resurrection and how they really cohere, how they fit together and suggest strongly we're talking about eyewitnesses who knew what they were talking about when they described the events. Well, similarly, I introduced uh, an artifact called the Shroud of Turin. You remember that a couple of weeks ago we talked about that? Yeah, it really is something. Now, you know, at Ruach we have no particular um, skin in the game, if you will, when it comes to relics and all those kind of things. There are traditions that rely very heavily on these. Not so much Messianic Judaism, not so much Judaism generally, but every once in a while something comes along which is so amazing that we, we take note. And I pointed out a couple of weeks ago that the Shroud of Turin seems to be one of those things. Again, it's a 14 foot long cloth, three feet high, and in it is the negative image, this is an amazing thing, of a crucified man. And uh, it was 1898 when an Italian photographer, Secundo Pia, uh, was developing pictures of the shroud which he had taken during an exposition or when the shroud was shown publicly and he, he, uh, uh, he uh, dropped his cannoli almost when, um, uh, when he saw that this negative image which was rather uh, dim and non-distinct all of a sudden was filled with, with all kinds of detail. And we talked about that last week. We mentioned, you know, the anatomical detail, how, how it's no forger could have come up with that. It was too, and especially working from a negative image. I mean, it's just impossible. And we talked about various things. I won't get into all of them, but there's a couple of things that I did mention last time that I thought were uh, particularly uh, exciting from our standpoint. One is we mentioned that because of high level or um, 
high resolution photography, scientists have been able to discover that in the eyes of the man of, of, Shirin, of, uh, of the shroud of Turin are two little Roman coins. Does anyone remember the technical name? Starts with an L. I'm just curious if you happen to remember. A lepton. Lepton, it's the smallest of the Roman coins, ancient Roman coins in that area, certainly. And um, what's so cool about this particular, uh, in these images in both eyes is that there were four distinct markings which indicate exactly what coin this was and when it was minted. Does anyone remember? Again, you don't have to know, but I'm just curious. You remember the year it was minted? 29. It was minted in the year 29 by uh, Pontius Pilate, who we know from, from the gospel narratives and, and from archaeology now, too. So here you have this coin minted in 29 in Jerusalem by Pontius Pilate, and they're in the eyes. I mean, believe me, no forger in the Middle Ages would come up with that, but even more wonderful from our standpoint, as we take our place in the flow of Jewish history, um, what was on his arm? And Tefillin, right, the bayit on his head and on his arm, the bayit, the little box, and uh, also the, the wrap, the straps, the leather straps uh, on his arm. And these were pictured in the shroud. It's just amazing. So that is so meaningful for us, isn't it, guys? It's so meaningful because what does it do? Here you have the quintessential uh, um, relic representing, in this case, the, the, uh, the Catholic community, the Catholic Church, and it, that doesn't feel Jewish. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's, it's a different tradition, and it, it has its own symbols and resonances and, and a lot of very positive things and, and all, but it doesn't feel Jewish. But then you have the man in the shroud in this quintessential ultimate, you know, um, relic, and he's got filling on. I think that is so cool. I hope you do too. And it gives me joy, and I hope it gives you joy too. Not only because it really looks like this is, the shroud is excellent corroborative evidence uh, for the resurrection of Yeshua. If we didn't have it, it's no big deal. We got plenty of other evidence, but it's corroborative, it's helpful. And, and also, it just shows the essential Jewishness of the whole experience of Yeshua's death and resurrection. Okay, so those, that's from last time. But now what I want to do is I want to conclude our discussion of Isaiah 53, which really um, is relevant in this discussion because the shroud, because of the evidence of the suffering and all that's happening, is a kind of, um, well, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. Isaiah 53 is almost a divinely inspired commentary on the meaning of the shroud. We could think about it that way. I don't think that was God's intention, but it's just an interesting juxtaposition of here you have the shroud, and then you have Isaiah 53. Well, we're not going to go through the whole passage. We've been through some, some of it. I'll just quote a couple of verses we looked at several weeks ago. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Yarum benesav gavama od. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and my servant servant will be so lifted up, God says. Notice the next words. And as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred more than human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Remember that a few weeks ago? Here you have Messiah exalted and the next breath he's beaten to a pulp. Wow. What an image, amazing. And uh, then I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna skip a few verses because we've already talked about this and you can uh, look on the website and, or in, on YouTube and you can find my comments on them. But I want to move on to, to verse six. And in verse six, we begin to get the meaning of what the servant's suffering is. And again, reflected so poignantly in the Shroud of Turin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, powerful words, especially after reading the Torah portion today about the, the Kohen Gadol uh, offering the offering of Azazel and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the bulls during Yom Kippur, all that. 
it, it, it has a lot of resonance. But I want to look at it not so much from like a historical point of view or from, um, from even the theological point of view. I want to ask you implicitly, you don't have to answer, but, I, but I'd like you to think about this. Is there any joy to be derived from the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all? Now just think about that for a second. Well, it's not joyful in that we feel bad that the servant had to suffer unjustly, but there is an element of joy that comes because what this shows, and this is a theme I want to mention more than once, what it shows is that this fabulous God of Israel, who's the God of the world, that he is willing to suffer for the sake of our good. And I want to tell you, that ain't Zeus, right? And that ain't Krishna. It is the God of Israel who takes a piece of himself and comes among us in the person of the servant, the Mashiach, and is willing to do good for us through his own suffering. Now that is love, because that's sacrificial love. And I defy you to come up with an example of an example of a deity or, or a semi-deity like spacemen or whatever people are into that manifests the love for little people like you and me that way. And I want to suggest to you that this is great reason for our joy. Maybe not jumping up and down in that kind of way because it's counterbalanced with the, the picture of the suffering of the, of the innocent one. But nonetheless, when you want to talk about a deep resonant joy, this is amazing, and it's true. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And here you have something also which can lead us to joy, because the servant had the power to call down legions of angels, heavenly beings that are more powerful than any people. And, and they could have wiped out all the, his persecutors, just wiped them out like that, dematerialized them, sent them far away. But he didn't do that. He was willing to be like a sheep led to slaughter, passive at this moment, though not forever, but at this moment passive, and thereby making atonement for, for Israel and for the nations. I mean, it's great stuff. And it's true, head goes with heart, okay? Notice this, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. By oppression and judgment, that's courtroom language, mishpat is used. That's the idea of a kangaroo court. And that's exactly what happened to Yeshua. The Sanhedrin wanted to get rid of him. The Romans wanted to get rid of him. Listen, when, when the government wants to get rid of you, if there are no counterbalancing forces to prevent that from happening, back then, let me tell you, they found a way to do it, and it was, that's what they did. They got rid of him, and it was through this kind of judgment and uh, through a court, court picture. Okay, and this is a really interesting one. Check this out now. And they made his grave with the wicked and a, with a rich man in his death, though he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, if apart from Yeshua and, the, and the, the story of Yeshua, the true story of Yeshua, this verse makes very little sense. And he made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. But from, in retrospect, we know exactly what it means. Because when Yeshua was killed, they intended to throw him into a mass grave like a boot, boot hill, you know, where you, you, you put the criminals. And yet, a courageous guy named Yosef, from a little town in Israel, Arimathea, he comes and begs the body of Yeshua and says, listen, let me take him. I want to put him in my grave. And that's exactly what happened. So although it was intent, the intention of the authorities to just kill him and, and throw his body in a... In a in a, uh, in a very um, dehumanizing kind of way, that wasn't what happened. He ended up in the tomb of a rich man. Something to be excited about. And, um, 
And, and then again we see, though he had done no violence, nor there was there any deceit in his mouth. Then, as we come to the conclusion of this passage, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, that's the Hebrew is asham, it's a guilt offering. He shall see, God shall, rather he, the servant, shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper at his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, God says, make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. Now here, what do you have? Here you have, all of a sudden, is the servant still dead? Yes or no? No. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper to his hand. The servant, the servant gets to experience, I'll read it again, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, God says of the servant. In other words, he comes back to life. This is a picture of the resurrection. It's kind of embedded subtly, but not so subtly that you know, you'd miss it. It's really there. And so he comes back to, to life again and we have this magnificent passage of the suffering servant, and we'll move on from this in, in future sermons. But I wanted to share Yeshua's commentary on this passage. And it's just, it's repeated a few times, but it's just one verse, and it's from our Basora reading today. Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And it gets back to our basic point. What where does joy come from? Well, there's levels of joy. I had a lot of fun last week. It was joyful. The whole nickel gang went out for breakfast, uh, celebrate Ari's birthday, and then we played basketball together. A new game, I never heard of it before, yeah. called Knockout. You ever play Knockout? Yep. What fun. The kids and the adults, joyful. That's a level of joy. But that's somewhat fleeting, because the and then everyone goes home. There's all kinds of joy. There's joy in your wedding day. There's joy when your first child is born or when your seventh child is born, right? Rabbi Nathan, yeah. joy? Sure, absolutely, without question. Uh, there's different kinds of joy, but the most long-lasting joy is what we're after, and that is the joy that gives you a sense that this universe is a friendly place, that life is a gift, that it comes from God, and that there's a thousand reasons to be thankful, because thankfulness is very much related to joy. And I want to encourage us all to make sure that we seek joy, not just fun, fun is good, fun is okay, not just superficial pleasures, some of which are fine, no problem, you know, great food, a good flick, a great movie, but all of that is relatively inconsequential compared to what God would have for us, and that is to seek joy individually and as a congregation. It is, and I won't get into this, but it's even neuropsychology, which I've been reading about lately, says that joy, joy is integrally connected with the ability to move ahead in life and to find God and find love and be good and all the different things. So seek joy and know, and know in your knower that we as believers of the Lord God of Israel, who demonstrates his love by sending the servant, the Mashiach, to give himself for us, we have every reason to be joyful. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Yeah.